A couple of weeks ago, the most watched sporting event in North America was televised. What was that? Oh, thank you, Super Bowl, yes, the Super Bowl. Two teams played in this contest to determine the championship and the supremacy, who would have supremacy in North American football. And what's interesting is on the day of the game, there was not one, two, three, four, five, six, but seven hours of pregame coverage. Some of the wives are going, uh, <laughs> seven hours of pregame coverage on television, examining every player, every play, the potential scenarios for the big game. And sports writers and commentators were outdoing themselves in hyping the event and raising the teams to some sort of mythic heights. And they were talking about the players as if they were the gods of sports. One writer, not this Super Bowl, but another one, described them as the gods of sport. Well, I think the Super Bowl is a great athletic event, fun to watch, especially the commercials, but far short of what is required to be any kind of a God, especially the true God. It's interesting, however, to note that people still associate great skill and achievement with a superior or a supreme being. Even if it's a sports God, you have to be pretty good. Thankfully, in the Bible, we have a description of one who actually is God, and what it says about him goes far beyond the ability to run or to throw or to catch a ball. In the book of Colossians, and I'd like you to open your Bibles to Colossians chapter one. We're going to study from that chapter in a moment. In the book of Colossians, Paul describes the true nature and the achievements of the one who we believe is indeed divine. One we believe who is indeed immortal, supreme. One that we believe is actually God. And that is, of course, Jesus Christ. I want to give you just a moment of background to the epistle of uh, Colossians so that we understand some of the things that Paul is saying here in context. In writing to the Colossian brethren, Paul describes the supremacy of Jesus Christ to a church who had begun to drift away from the faith. False teachers had crept in and begun teaching a gospel, their own gospel, that mixed together different ideas. They had some ideas from uh, Greek philosophical thinkers, the idea of duality. They mixed in pagan cultic practices. They even added Jewish religious traditions along with the teachings of Christianity. These teachers blended all of these components into a kind of a new gospel which they claimed would give people a more dynamic spiritual experience. The new gospel, the new and improved gospel is what they were promoting. Instead of faith practiced in loving obedience as Jesus had taught, these teachers promoted a strict form of asceticism. In other words, denial of certain foods and uh, vows of celibacy. And they were telling their followers that this would provide the spiritual power needed to gain salvation that they so desire. This type of teaching and practice was clearly in opposition to the true gospel. And so in response to these heresies, Paul writes a letter to these brethren. And he puts forth two main ideas in his epistle to the Colossian church in order to refute this new gospel, this new and improved gospel. So the first thing that he establishes with them 
is the fact that it is Jesus Christ who is supreme. In chapter, uh, beginning in chapter one, verses 15 to 18, basically he says to them, it is Jesus, not, not these teachers, not their new methods, not any other person, not any other teaching that is superior. And in stating this fact, Paul describes seven areas of Jesus' supremacy. Seven areas of Jesus' supremacy. So I want you to open a chapter one of Colossians and we'll look at verse 15. Seven areas of Jesus' supremacy. Number one, he says, He is the supreme spirit. Verse 15, he says, and He is the image of the invisible God. He is the image of the, not a reflection, He is of the same nature as the invisible God. As the image of God, Paul says, Jesus is God. No other spirit invented by man is His equal. Second area of Jesus' supremacy. Paul says, Jesus holds the supreme position. Verse 15b says, and He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. In other words, no created thing is before Him in time or in position. And that term firstborn is a title referring to Jesus' position in time. Not that He is the first of many, but rather that He is unique among all that have been, uh, that exist. Number three, He says, Jesus is the supreme authority. Verse 16, for by Him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. I don't know if you can get any more complete than that. He is the supreme authority. Every level of creation from the unseen particles to the greatest king or the greatest leader, Paul says, is subject to Jesus' authority. Not only is His authority greater, but every other authority is in service to His authority. Number four, he says, Jesus is the supreme reason for existence. And he says that in verse 16b, he says, all things have been created by Him and for Him. He is the answer to every great question and the end of every great search. He gives meaning to all things. Number five, he says, he is supreme in power, verse 17. Verse 17, he says, and He is before all things and, all, and in Him all things hold together. It is by His energy that the physical world continues to exist. It isn't gravity, it isn't black holes, not exploding galaxies. Jesus is the power source for all existing things. Number six, he says, Jesus is the supreme head of organized religion on earth. Verse 18, he is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Only Jesus, by virtue of his supremacy, has a right to be worshiped as God, only he. He and only He is the true religious and spiritual head. All others, and I mean all others, are pretenders and false prophets. And then number seven, I read a little bit of it in verse 18b, He is the supreme leader of the eternal kingdom of heaven. I'll read it again, it says, He is also head of the body of the church and He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that He Himself, might come to have first place in everything. Notice that Paul is mentioning everything, all, supreme. There's, there's no holding back here in the description he gives concerning Jesus Christ. In the spiritual world, he is the leader of the angels 
and spirit beings that were created before us, as well as the supreme leader of those who have joined them from the earth below. In the kingdom of heaven, Jesus is Lord of all forever. Now, after establishing Jesus' supreme position in all of these areas, Paul explains one other important fact about Jesus that they need to be reminded of. He says, Jesus, this supreme Lord, sacrificed Himself for them. Jesus, the supreme Lord, who's over everything and everyone and all time in every way, this supreme Lord sacrificed Himself for them. Let's read how he puts forth this idea in verse 19. He says, for it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Him and through Him to reconcile all things to Himself, having made peace through the blood of His cross, through Him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Paul's point here is who needs human philosophy, who needs cultural rituals and human effort when the Supreme Lord has personally undertaken the task of saving those who were condemned to death by sin. What foolishness it is of man to try to invent a better gospel. What foolishness it is for man to try to worship some better savior. No amount of human wisdom and effort could accomplish what the Supreme Lord had accomplished for them. And by extension, what the Supreme Lord has accomplished for us. So Paul furnishes this, excuse me, he finishes this section by reminding them of three things. If they accept what he has just taught them, you know, the Supreme Lord, that's Jesus, and this Supreme Lord Jesus has died for them. If they accept these two ideas, then they need to remember three other things that follow naturally from these two basic concepts. Number one, he says, remember the way that you were saved. Remember that. In verse 21 and 22, we're still in chapter one. He says, and although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet He has now reconciled you in His fleshly body through death in order to present you before Him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. He explains that their sins against God are what made them guilty and subject to condemnation and punishment in hell. There's no doubt about that. But he goes on to say, it was the blood of Jesus, that supreme one, lest we forget who He is. It was the blood of Jesus, the supreme one, that washed away their guilt, that made them free and able to stand before God without fear. You know what a, do you know what a, a marvelous blessing it is to be able to stand before God without fear? I mean, we read in the Bible about angel, excuse me, we read in the Bible about people in the Old Testament who, who would come face to face with an angel or, or, or sometimes with a pro, in front of a prophet and they would fall on their face in fear. Can you imagine what it, what it must be like to come face to face with God? And yet Paul is saying, those who are saved you know, by that supreme one, they can come before God without fear, without shame, without, without guilt. The cross, the blood, the sacrifice of Jesus, this is what makes them pure, beyond reproach and acceptable to God. Not self-sacrifice, not self-demeaning activities, not the learning of mysteries. So remember, remember how you were saved, he says. If you accept that 
Jesus is the supreme one and that He died for you, then remember how you were saved. He also says, remember to remain faithful. Continuing in verse 23, he says, if indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast. Note that he says, if there is a condition here, God's grace we know and we've taught so many times is free. We cannot buy it, we can't earn it, we can't sell it, we can't obtain it based on our conditions. We cannot produce it, we cannot force God to give it to us based on our effort or wisdom or actions. God is the one that sets the conditions for grace. He is the one that establishes the one criteria for its procurement and that one condition is faith. You can only obtain this wonderful soul cleansing grace through faith and that faith is expressed according to His will and purpose. Grace is free, but it is not given to scoffers. Grace is free, but it's not given to disbelievers. Grace is free, but it's not given to the disobedient. If it was, then sinners and disbelievers like Herod and Hitler and Stalin would be with Christ this very moment, even though they hated Him and they hated His church during their lifetimes. No. Grace is extended to those who have faith. And in Colossians chapter two, a little further down in verse 11 and 12, Paul further explains that faith in Christ is properly expressed in baptism. And let's read that a little further down, chapter two, because it's all one thought. We don't have time to read the whole book, but it's all of one thought here in chapters one and two. Go to chapter two, verse 11. And Paul is again talking about the Supreme Lord Jesus here. He says, and in Him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with Him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with Him through faith in the working of God who raised Him up from the dead. And so in Colossians, Paul is simply repeating what Peter explained to the Jews in Jerusalem on Pentecost Sunday, when they said, men and brethren, well, what do we have to do? And what did, what did Peter respond? Did he say, well, you're going to have to learn the mysteries. Is that what he said? Did he say, well, you're going to have to you know, really go into, you're going to have to have a crash diet. <laughs> you're going to have to swear off meat, you know? And those of you who are not married, you're going to have to make vows of celibacy. And those of you who are married, maybe you ought to make vows. Is that what he said? He said exactly what Paul is saying here. Repent, he said. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. You know, it's an interesting thing. People sometimes say, well, you know, he was saying that, but it was just a kind of a spiritual thing. You know, Peter was in Pentecost. Just the spiritual, you know, to be immersed in the spirit of Jesus. That's really what he meant. You know, there was no water there. Do you think all those people went all the way to the Jordan on that day? But if you go to Israel and you visit the old city, Jerusalem, the holy city, there are gates, of course. You know there are gates around the city. People went in from different ways and there's the if you're standing on the Mount of Olives and you're looking down at the city, there's the pilgrim gate at the, on the left side. That's where the pilgrim gate was and that's where people from all over the world would come to Jerusalem during that time, Bible times, in order to come and worship at the temple. Jews who lived away from Jerusalem, proselytes who, who were converted to Judaism would come and those who would come from far away would come through the pilgrim gate, the priests would enter uh, through the eastern gate, but the, 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 the pilgrims would come through the uh, pilgrim gate. We, kn we know Peter was preaching there, why? Because he was preaching to people from all over the world. Well, the people from all over the world would come through the, the pilgrim gate. 
And what was interesting about this visit that, uh, that I took many years ago was our guide was explaining to us that down there at the Pilgrim Gate, the archeologists have found the foundations for the gigantic pools of water that were at the Pilgrim Gate. And he explained, to, and this is a Jew, mind you, he's not a Christian, this is a Jew. He explained that when pilgrims came from far away on dusty, dirty roads and they'd been traveling for weeks, before they would enter into the holy city to go to the temple to offer sacrifice and so on and so forth, they would wash themselves, they would purify themselves. Where, where do you think they did that? Well, they did that at the pools that were there at the pilgrim gate. How long do you think it would take 12 strong fishermen, healthy young men to baptize 3,000 people in a large pool of water? I think it only take a couple of hours, don't you? This is where the 3,000 would have easily obeyed the gospel as 12 healthy men immersed them on that day. And so let's remember where we're at here, just a little historical note. So Paul reminds them to remain faithful, assured that the grace of God to remove all of their sins was applied completely when they called on the name of Jesus in repentance and in baptism. So remember how you were saved. Remember to remain faithful. And then he also says to them, remember the gospel itself. I go back to chapter one, this time verse 23. I repeat, he says, if indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel, that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. You see, for these people back at that time, the danger was that with their false teachings, these men were moving them away from the original gospel message. It was a new gospel. It was, quote, a new and improved gospel that they were promoting. And in so doing, they were also moving them away from Christ because Jesus Christ is one with his gospel. If you move away from his gospel, you're also moving away from him. And therein lie the danger. To deny the gospel of Christ is to deny Christ himself. So Paul tells them to remember. Remember Christ as the only supreme one. Remember his cross as the only way to gain forgiveness and perfection. And remember his gospel as the only true message of hope for yourself and the only message that you're ready to share with others. If they did this, Paul says, the Supreme Lord Jesus would remain their personal Savior and their personal Lord forever. So as Paul encouraged the Colossians in his letter, I want to encourage you this evening who have come tonight to this service to hold on. Hold on to four important things as you live your Christian lives. Very briefly, I encourage you to hold on to Christ. He is the true and living God. There are no other gods. There are no other prophets. There are no other saviors. Despite wars or climate change or economic upheavals, whatever, He always remains the Supreme Lord. One of my most comforting prayers is always the thought that no matter what is happening in the world or what is happening in my personal life, Jesus Christ is always worthy to be praised. Jesus Christ is always worthy to be worshiped, no matter what's happening in my life. Jesus will save you, He will sustain you, and He will surround you with His love forever. So I exhort you, hold on to Jesus Christ. Secondly, I would encourage you to hold on to the cross of Christ. You know, there'll be all kinds of new prophets coming out, new teachings, new promises, no matter what, hold on to the cross of Jesus. When you feel that you are unworthy, hold on to the cross of Jesus. 
when you are afraid that all is lost, hold on to the cross of Jesus Christ. Hold on to the cross as the one act in all of history that will serve to save you and to keep you saved forever. Thirdly, hold on to the gospel of Christ. Hold on to Christ, hold on to His cross, hold on to the gospel. You know, technology changes and society changes, but people are the same today as the day that Adam sinned. God preached the gospel to Adam because it was the answer to his problem of sin and it remains the answer to the problem of sin today in our generation. Let us not change the gospel. Let's not be ashamed of the gospel, make excuses for the gospel, water down the gospel. Let us instead take every advantage that technology has given us to proclaim the glorious gospel to every sinner on earth. And then finally, if we're holding on to things, I would say, let's hold on to each other. The world filled with unbelievers and scoffers and evil men and women who are Satan's willing servants. And in the society that we live in, you know, uh, uh, Hal and I, we work a lot on these videos and on our, uh, our website, BibleTalk.tv, to preach the gospel and to teach and so on and so forth. And sometimes you know, we're talking and it gets a little discouraging. Somebody, for example, will, I don't know, you know appear half naked, you know, on, on, show a picture of themselves half naked and, uh, on YouTube or something, and in one day, 10 million people are going to be looking at that. And that person will have you know, their 15 minutes of fame. And yet we have a thousand hours, a thousand hours of preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we get maybe a thousand people a month that will, I mean that's great, don't get me wrong, that's great, a thousand people come to the website and they download things and they copy things and that's terrific. But some yahoo will take off their clothes and a gazillion people will watch them in a day and they'll be interviewed on TV you know, for doing something foolish and stupid. And not only myself, but all the good preachers and all the good Bible teachers who labor in God's word will be happy. Oh boy, all 22 of my students showed up this week to hear my class, my Bible class. Despite this type of discouragement, let's hold on to the gospel and let's hold on to the cross and let's hold on to Christ and as I said, let's hold on to each other. Because Christians need each other. Let's not hurt each other. Let's forgive and be kind to those for whom Christ died and within whom the Holy Spirit resides. I always say to myself when a brother or sister is doing something or whatever, an attitude that I'm not crazy about or gets on my nerves, I'm reminded, you know what? The Holy Spirit living in them too, you know. You're not the only one that has the Holy Spirit. Everybody here who has obeyed the gospel, the Spirit of God dwells in them. Be careful of your attitude towards that other person because the Spirit of God is in them too. You're not the only one. And so let's make the loving of each other our main priority for this church. I've often said the gospel is what brings people into the church, but it's the love of the brethren that keep them in the church. It's loving one another that helps people get through the rough moments in life. And we can be sure that when we do this, this will be pleasing to the Lord Jesus Christ and it will promote the very best witness of our faith in Him. And so, obviously, as I close out my lesson tonight, I say to you, if Jesus Christ is not your Lord, is not your supreme Lord, if you have not been saved in the way that the supreme Lord has asked you to come to Him in salvation, then of course I encourage you to repent, to be baptized this day, so that Holy Spirit we were talking about will also 
dwell in you and will fulfill all the promises of Christ in you on that day. And if you've been unfaithful to Him, you can also come for forgiveness and restoration as Bobby leads us in the song that we've selected. Please consider seriously your response to the invitation tonight as we stand and as we sing.